Well, thank you for joining us um, this afternoon. Uh, my name's Andrew Dowling. I'm a member of the Fidelity Australia Wholesale Distribution Team. And uh, we're joined today by Gary Monaghan, Investment Director uh, for the Fidelity Asia Strategies. And uh, just by uh, way of uh, background on today's briefing, um, Gary has been with the business uh, for 14 years, uh, both in Hong Kong for 10 years, as well as being based over in our United Kingdom office for a number of years as well. Uh, Gary will take us through a current view on what's happening across Asian markets, uh, particularly around the Asian Fidelity Asian Equities Fund, uh, walk you through uh, current positioning strategy and give you a good sense of uh, where to from here with regards to the fund strategy. Uh, the Fidelity Asia Fund um, has now been available in the Australian market for just over 17 years. Uh, it has outperformed the index over every major time period since inception. And uh, Anthony Throm, who Gary works alongside and has worked alongside since the establishment of the strategy, uh, or since Anthony took over in June 2014, uh, the fund has delivered 10.6% um, uh, net of fees, which is 4.7% above benchmark, a good, strong, consistent performance all the way through. So on that note, uh, Gary, thank you for joining us today. We do appreciate it. And uh, over to you to share your insights and thoughts on what's happening in the region uh, and how uh, Anthony and the team are exploiting the opportunities that present themselves in this challenging market. Thank you, Andrew. And um, to be honest, it, it feels like the, the story changes every two weeks. And so um, it, it's, it's good to have an update because what we've seen in the last two weeks or so has, has certainly been a lot more positive um, versus the news flow that we've had, you know, for the previous probably 12 months or so. Um, but, but we'll go through the pack um, and we'll, we'll sort of get to some of the thoughts and opinions and, and how we're actually uh, adjusting for that in the portfolio as well. So just, uh, just briefly as a bit of background before going into that sort of detail, um, just to remind everyone what, what we're trying to do. Um, and basically we're trying to beat the benchmark, which is the Asia, the all country Asia X Japan uh, index. And, and we're trying to do that with a concentrated portfolio. Now, now obviously we've got the World Cup coming up. So the way I think about this is that we think the best way to beat the benchmark is not to think about the benchmark and not to behave like it. And, and in the same way, when I think about football, um, if you want to beat the team in front of you, you, you play your own game right? and, and you don't play to the other team. Otherwise, you start to look like that other team and, and you don't play to your strengths. And, and so what we try and do as bottom up stock pickers is focus on what we think are the best opportunities within within the region um, concentrate the capital there. You have a differentiated uh, pr profile um, of the portfolio than the benchmark. But if you back your, your judgment and back the stock picking ability of the team, um, you could end up with you know, a strong outcome, basically. And, and, and as you said uh, in your introduction, we, we've got a very strong annualised outperformance um, over the eight plus years that we've been managing the, the Fidelity Asia strategy. Now, just because we have around sort of 20 to 35 stocks um, doesn't mean that we, we come at it with more risk. And with so much time is spent around understanding the businesses, really understanding where the true risk lies within the stocks that we're, that we're looking to select for the portfolio. Uh, and, and putting them in the portfolio accordingly. And so we're also looking at you know, very important factors such as volatility of the stock, liquidity, of course, um, and as we'll get on to a bit later on, correlation. Um, we, you, know, you, you could add one, two, five stocks to the portfolio. Um, if they're highly correlated with each other, you know, what diversification are you actually really truly bring to the table? So it's something that we, we really look at in, in great detail um, when we're looking to manage the, the risk overall of the portfolio. Um, and then finally, just on, on the point of style neutral, um, what this really means in practice is that we're not trying to be value, we're not trying to be growth or anything in between. We're just trying to make money. We're trying to see where the risk reward makes most sense um, and, and where we think we can capture the most alpha, basically, and, and, and put our capital to work accordingly. Um, to us, you know, we've had people come to us in the past and say, oh, you've got a slight growth part profile or you've got, looks like you're going more value. That's just where the money making opportunity lies for us, you know, in the current market today, as we take a you know, sort of two year view or, or so ahead. And, and so, as I said, we're not trying to be anything other than uh, other than alpha generators. And so that can lead you down different sort of style tilts in, in different market conditions. Um, but, but overall, we're trying to build a concentrated fund where each position has a meaningful contribution to performance. You know, we put in the work, we put in the effort you know, and, and 
don't put 20 basis points there, right? Because if it's if you're right, you might make 10. Um, you put 2%, and if you're right, you make 1%, and, and, and do that again in a, in a very risk-managed way. Um, just a quick overview of the investment process. I mean, the bulk of the ideas come from our, our research network. We, we've, we've got 45 Asia X Japan analysts on the ground. Um, of course, we've got the 10 or so in Sydney as well, which we will tap into as part of the global research network. Um, but, but the 45 Asia X Japan analysts are, you know, the key drivers of ideas. They understand how the process works. They understand what we're looking for. Um, and, and they will bring those ideas to the table and they will help with the analysis and, and, and valuation and such of, of the stocks. Um, but of course, very importantly, we, we have our own investment process overlay on top of the work that the analyst team does. Um, so, so we don't just blindly follow uh, what, what the analyst suggests. Um, we can have a difference of opinion, of course, and, and that's actually actively encouraged, actually, because you can start to debate and, and hopefully you, you, you start to cross all angles um, and, and cover every, um, you know, every sort of outcome potentially for that business and get more holistic and deeper analysis overall. Um, when we're looking at the uh, at the process, as I said, we put the sort of process overlay on top of what the analysts do. You know, probably nothing that you've any listener hasn't heard before, but looking at fundamental sentiment and valuation. Um, but but what does that mean for us in practice? Well, well, from a fundamental perspective, when we assess a company, you know, from the typical bottom up analysis, the management team, the strategy of the business, industry structure, which is really important actually within the process. Um, you, you've got to come out of a number. So we look at things like earnings growth for the next one to two years, and we'll look at the direction of return on incremental capital as well. And, and we compare that versus the market, the, the general consensus thinking. If we think the same, then we don't have an edge, move on. And, and, and let's concentrate on finding ideas where we have a differentiated view, understand why, understand the risk to, to, to that differentiated view, um, and, and make a, uh, an assessment accordingly uh, and, and hopefully um, that, that stock will be a candidate for the portfolio because we think that something is being overlooked. Um, we're also at the same time looking at sentiment. And so what piques our interest? We, you know, first and foremost, an in, in a whole market or, or a sector um, gets, gets absolutely smashed. You know, that's really interesting because, you know, as, as everyone knows, people sort of, what's it called, throw the baby out of the bathwater, everything gets sold off. And you can pick through the wreckage and there's often you know, a few diamonds in the rough. Um, and, and that's where you can really make some interesting uh, sort of money as, as, as we look ahead. You know, in particular, if we look at the portfolio right now, things like uh, areas related to the, the China property sector, ugly industry right now. Um, there have been, and we can touch on this a bit later, but there have been some developments in terms of policy which point to a better future. Um, but for the last 12 months, it's been ugly. Um, the, the privately owned um, uh, uh, estate, um, privately owned property developers have not been able to get funding. Um, they've got a lot of unfinished projects. It's created a whole host of problems around consumer sentiment. Um, and, and, and they're not paying their bills, right? And so therefore it impacts areas like in, um, building supplies and such. It, it's not great. And, and fundamentally, you know, it doesn't, it's, it's not particularly good either. Um, but, but what are we thinking about from a sentiment perspective? Well, it's hated, it's very cheap. Anything that touches the property sector in China is cheap. Um, and it's not going away, right? Because property is so fundamentally important, both to the GDP um, of, of, of China, um, but also to this sort of social harmony, right? People need housing, they need good housing as well for, for this social harmony that China talks about. So the property sector is still gonna be around. So then, okay, let's start to pick through the wreckage of, of what's gone on. And for us, building supplies and building building material supplies are quite interesting because we are seeing that they're getting unpaid bills. They see the account receivables are going up. Um, the stocks have been sold off because it looks you know, like, a, like a pretty rough situation for, for the balance sheets. Um, but at the same time, you say, well, the industry structure is going to change here because the weaker players get um, sort of taken out because they can't survive. The stronger players will gain market share. Um, and when things turn, they're in a much stronger, stronger position uh, in, in that turning cycle. And so therefore, what comes of that will be greater pricing power um, and you know, a potentially greater uh, total addressable market than they had before. Um, and, and so therefore, you look at that sentiment, say, right, that looks pretty tough out there right now. Let's pick through the wreckage. Let's think through how's it impacting industry structure? 
what how how do companies sort of play within that and and there could be some really interesting uh long-term money making opportunities that offer attractive risk reward because there's limited downside uh, and there's a lot of valuation support um so so with that as well of course is valuation and so no position is taken where we do not have you know a a a level of comfort around valuation and it's really critical and that and that valuation discipline is is really is a discipline where we have our lines in the sand that we don't cross um and even when it feels uncomfortable that you want to buy something because you know that there's a bit of momentum behind it but but it's just it hasn't reached that line in the sand uh that that, that we think is a buy the time to sort of buy um, and you can sometimes feel you miss it, but be disciplined and one day it might it may well come back. And, and we've got examples in the fund, you know, where Tektronic is, is, is an example from 2020 where, you know, we were looking at Tektronic. Um, you know, we kind of missed it initially a few years back. It came back to a really attractive level in 2020 and it was a huge contributor for us in, in sort of 2020 and into, into 2021. Um, and it's actually an example which I'll touch on a bit later as well. So be really disciplined on valuation um, and, and, you know, ultimately we can buy stocks at the right, pl- right price. It helps drive performance boosted by that fundamental and sentiment view as well. Um, and finally, just on, on portfolio construction, you know, we, I, I've talked a bit about um, the correlation, which I will go on to, but you've got to look at things like volatility, liquidity and all these things that play a role in the portfolio construction and position sizes. But we will go up to ten percent in a single stock, uh, and we, as long as the liquidity is there, we've got conviction. Um, it offers an element of correlation benefits to the portfolio. We will go ten percent, and, and we're comfortable doing that. Um, and we've got many examples um, in the past, um, and, and actually, you know, a couple in the present as well, where where we've gone up to ten percent um, in, in in an absolute and potentially a relative position if, if it's a non benchmark position. So, so what to expect? Well, as I said, it's around roughly 20 to 35 stocks. Um, you, those with eagle eyes will, will see that the stock count dipped for a short while um, to around 19. That was as we had some stocks out because of that valuation discipline where we felt that there was limited upside. We were selling and we were waiting for a couple of ideas to come into our, into our buy range. And so we had a, a period where we were sort of below that 20 line. We're at 21 stocks today. Um, and, and, you know, we are a concentrated fund and, and with concentration comes high active money. The way I often put this is you, you pay active fees, you get active money with us. And, and, and so as a result, we, we live and die by stock selection. Um, you know, there, there's obviously we, we, people look at sector and country overweights and underweights that, that, that we may well have. Um, but uh, it, it's stock selection that drives those positions um, overall. And, and that is, uh, what what drives our performance? Just um, going back to probably for the third time, I think now uh, on correlations, and because this does play a key role in what we do. And when we're looking at ideas, you know, let, let's say we've got a stock that ticks the box on fundamentals and sentiment, and and, and I hope and valuation as well. That's the, the 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 ideal sort of trifecta and the perfect outcome. Um, we we work with the risk team to look at time weighted correlations, and if a new idea. That, that potentially is, is consideration for the portfolio shows high levels of correlation against you know a group of stocks in the fund. We've got a decision to make. Right? Do we add it or not? Um, and if we do add it, what comes out? Because basically, if you're adding a stock that's got high correlation uh, to, uh, to to the portfolio already, you're not really adding that much diversification. Uh, you, you're adding potentially something that might be a bit more of a macro or thematic type of uh, input into the portfolio. You know, to, to give you an example, a, a sort of a more real life, real life example, um, one of our biggest positions in the portfolio for a pr- period of time, quite a long period of time, um, is HDFC Bank. Now, we've looked at the other Indian banks, the likes of uh, Kotak Mahindra, uh, you know, Axis Bank as well. Similar business drivers. Um, you know, it's the, the, the rise of, of the, 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 the GDP growth in India, um, the people, the unbanked becoming uh, sort of moving into the banking system and all, all, all that comes of it drives the likes of HDFC Bank and, and the other Indian banks as well. So then rather than own two, we want to own one, right? Because we don't have a basket of stocks behind a, let's call it a theme. 
Um, we want to get the best stock that we think will drive long-term alpha um, in the portfolio. So you put them side by side, you start going through in this example, working through management quality, the strategy of the business, um, deposit growth in the future, um, the ability to maintain and, and hopefully grow ROEs um, over, a, you know, over the longer term. Uh, and with that, as we sat there um, doing that work with the analyst, you know, HDFC Bank sort of stood out for us um, versus the others. And so you keep with that rather than own you know, a number of stocks. Um, if had we come to the conclusion that another of the holdings, uh, another of the stocks was a better option, we, we would have swapped quite simply. And, and that's how this sort of plays out through um, the portfolio. The other thing as well that we, while we think about this, is that in periods of market shock, um, everyone sells everything, right? And and co correlations converge to one in in a quick, in a quick manner. The further away you are from one, the slower you get there, and sh you should be able to um, just sort of generate some alpha in falling markets. Now it's not perfect; it doesn't happen like that every single time. Um, but but what you see in our upside downside capture ratio over the eight eight in a sort of bit years that we've been managing this strategy is that we've been able to generate decent alpha in the in falling markets. Um, and that is, we think, at least partly, um, and if not largely, down to the focus on, on interest stock correlations. I um, just want to sort of touch on, on, on total risk. Um, just because you've got a concentrated fund doesn't always mean high risk, right? And you know, if you look over history, the fund has always been similar, if not below that, uh, the total risk of the benchmark. Um, that is partly through the interest stock correlations coming through. It's also looking at the, volatil the volatility of the stocks when we're building positions. Um, but, but also we think the, the, the types of stocks we're looking for. We're looking for structural winners, uh, ultimately. Yes, there might, might be some volatility in some of these, um, but, but th those kind of core types of names that, that, that we're looking for that are unloved or just not being sort of regarded by the market at, 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 a, uh, at a moment in time, you know, the types of stocks that we're looking for. And we, and we think that that's helped sort of dampen uh, the total risk and not be too dissimilar from the index, despite only having a fraction of the names. You know, at, at times, like I said, we had 19 names for, for about six weeks um, a couple of months ago against the index of what, eight to 900 stocks or so, maybe even more than that. And yet, yet we're not massively dissimilar from a risk profile perspective. Um, but, you know, stock selection is what we live and die by. So um, you can see here that, that our stock specific, the, bl the blue line, um, is the key driver to, to our returns. And, and that is what drives what we do. And you know, I, I, we won't sit here, we, you know, too often sort of, sort of blame thematics or, um, you know, other such um, sort of macro drivers for, for performance, good or bad. Um, it's the stocks that we select. Um, of course, there are macro sort of drivers in, in, in a lot of the names that you look at because it impacts industry structure and, and, and market sentiment and such. Um, but ultimately, it's about the stocks that we select. And, and just on the right hand side, you can see the upside downside capture ratio that I referred to just now. And, and this is where we think the focus on interest stock correlations has helped, particularly on the, on the downside um, capture ratio over the last eight and you know, eight and a half years or so. So how has the fund performed? Um, now this is just the long-term rolling, the five-year rolling, uh, one-year one-year numbers. Um, you know, the, it, it is an outcome of our stock selection, and we've been able to generate alpha on a fairly consistent basis. Um, and you can see here on on, uh, on page ten, that on the right-hand side, as Andrew sort of mentioned at the beginning, you know, just under five hundred basis points um, annualized out performance over the last eight years or so, uh, net of fees, um, one year number has been rough, but we've been sort of in line with the benchmark year to date as of the end of October um, is about three and a half percent down roughly um, in the last couple of weeks. Um, as, of, as I'm recording this right now, um, we've made pretty much all of that back with the, with the turn in the market and, and market sentiment. That we think maybe hopefully catching up with our views. Um, so year to date doesn't look quite so bad as I'm sat here right now. I think we're pretty, pretty much flat with the benchmark. Um, but but on the longer term, yeah, it's stock selection that drives what we do and, and, and sort of consistent outperformance. Um, very quickly on here, we often get asked, you know, when, when will the fund do well, when, when won't it? And 
going back to my earlier points, stock selection is, is what we live and die by. And so there's no real consistent, let's call it theme or, or market environment where we do well or not. Um, now, this is looking on a, you know, a quarterly basis, looking at excess returns in you know, rising and falling markets, growth versus value, large versus small. Um, we, you know, we've generally been on the positive side, you know, been on, on the whole, uh, which has driven, driven that long term performance for us. Um, but there's not really anything that, that drives performance other than stock selection. Um, and, and, you know, that, that also goes to my point earlier where we're not a value fund. We're not trying to be growth. We're not trying to be value. Um, we are trying to find value in stocks. Um, but, but when you look at through, you know, various third party um, sort of matrices, we, you know, we, we can sort of flip um, sort of flip around a bit. Um, but, but, you know, if market style, um, doesn't really drive our performance on, on, on a long-term basis. And, you know, it, it stock selection again, is what, is what we, uh, is what drives our performance. So let's just touch on six month performance. Um, as, as I mentioned sort of earlier in it, as of year to date, it's been pretty tough, but the last six months we've been roughly flat as at the end of October. Um, what's driven that? Uh, we we always focus on the on the underperformers um, when we when we're assessing performance, but as, as we sit down and talk it through, because that's it, where you learn things. It, it's also where potentially mistakes are made, or where you know maybe you think we, we've got we've got this right over the long term, but we've been a bit early, and, and that's certainly the case uh, for for some of the names in in the sort of negative column uh, in the last six months. Um, in particular, I'm going to sort of refer to um, Beijing Oriental Yuhong, um, which is an A-share company. It's a, a waterproofing company. So they, they do uh, the, um, the membranes, the waterproof membranes for roofs. They, they do things like silicon waterproofing for, for the bathrooms and kitchens. It's been caught up in that, in that downdraft for property, the property sector. Now, this is a stock where we because it's been a big detractor we're saying right what you know, let's assess this what what is our outcome from our assessment our assessment is it's the right stock in the right change in industry structure uh, we bought it too early and and because of that we we've been topping up a little bit and we maintained this we're maintaining our position um in beijing oriental yuhong industry structure and and the sort of fundamentals what why are we still positive on it the uh, property sector, as I said, is you know, taking a big hit in China. We know that. Um, but as, as an outcome, the industry structure is changing as well for the building materials companies. And so Beijing Oriental Yuhong's um, uh, uh, competitors are being competed away, shall we say, because they don't have the deep enough pockets to survive the, the rise in accounts receivables that we've been seeing. So with that, um, Yuhong have, have been gaining market share. And interestingly for us, we've been seeing some data points that validate this, this sort of viewpoint where particularly in their uh, business to consumer business, um, they've been increasing their prices by sort of 10, 15% or so. And that's interesting because those pricing, those price hikes have stuck actually. And, you know, that, that points towards a higher average selling price over time, which is, which is good, obviously for, for the business. <clears throat> the other thing as well, we think because everyone you know, if I was talking about to you two weeks ago, um, it's slightly different now because there have been some policy changes in China, which has improved sentiment a little bit. Um, but, but everyone was looking at rising cost uh, base as well. And of course, oil is a is an input cost for, for waterproof materials uh, with the mastic and such. Now that those costs have gone down from a year ago, actually. And, you know, that's not really been reflected, we think, in, in, in the share price yet. Um, but but it, you know, we think it will be. Um, and, and then finally, you know, what's really driving this is just general negative sentiment. And you may have seen in the last sort of 10 days or so, as I'm recording this, um, is that we've, we've seen around uh, the, some changing policies in China. So they came out with 16 points uh, around property stimulus uh, and supporting a very strategically important sector. Um, and, and that's really boosted sentiment towards the, the property names um, and it points for a, a you know, slightly better outcome for, for the general property market overall. But, but why, someone like, why is someone like Beijing Oriental Yuhong interesting for us? Well, actually, 
it, it doesn't matter to them whether it's the privately managed companies or the state owned enterprise property developers that win out. They're selling to the same group, right? It, it doesn't matter if company A takes over company B, they're still selling to, to you know, to that business, the waterproofing. So, so overall, you know, we, we're quite comfortable with the position. We were just you know, a, bit, a bit too early on that. And the other two um, underperformers for us and are, are in the form of multi and uh, uh, focus media. So Quechua Multi um, is a Baidu company. So it's the white liquor that, that's synonymous with, in, with China. Um, it's the drink that, you, you know, you toast weddings, you, you toast at weddings. It's the, the drink of choice for, for various banquets and such. Um, and, and it's been caught in this sort of downdraft of negative consumer sentiment overall. Um, and probably more recently, it's taken a bit of a hit as well, because the outcome, of course, from the, the Congress um, was, was deemed to be a much more um, sort of I suppose, socialist sort of um, government and, and less reform minded going forward. And, and with that, people were concerned about companies that are deemed premium consumer companies, which, which multi certainly is. And we feel that that is probably overdone actually overall and and why was that sell-off overdone and and why are we sort of sticking with multi well a couple of things one is when you look at the the business structure 10 years ago when we first bought multi um you know the the, the she this is when she first came to power in 2012 actually you know there was this whole thing about anti-corruption and, and at the time around 90 percent of their business was government and soes and there was concern that the the demand would fall off a cliff um, and you know, business will be in you know, massive decline. What we actually saw is that with the limited demand from from government and consumer over the next couple of years, from 2012, the price point got to a po lower point where it became a consumer driven stock, and, and that was part of our thesis that it's so ingrained with heritage. As I said, it's something that you toast at banquets and weddings and everything. That that it will get to a price point where people are like, yeah, I can get this stuff now, and I, and and you know, we want to start buying it. And, and that's been the case. And as China's got um, sort of, uh, more wealthier and people have got more wealthier, the demand has continued to increase and, and that's not changed. So when we sit there and, and we, we we're hearing more recently that, you know, there's going to be more maybe frugal activities at the government level. Well, a lot of that's already played out and, and the government are not the big consumers now of multi and, and SOEs aren't, it's consumer. And that, that won't really change, um, you know, in our minds. And so therefore we felt that the sell-off was overdone. Um, <clears throat> and uh, and the, the other point as well um, with multi, <coughs> excuse me, um, it is, as I said, it's, it's a, you know, it, it's such a heavy brand, a heavily followed and well-known brand that it, it just is one of those things that's sort of here to stay somewhat. And, you know, with, with, the, the 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 consumer price might come down a bit, but that doesn't matter too much to multi because they sell at a factory price. The consumer price, if it comes down, uh, will impact the retailer, um, but it not, doesn't necessarily impact multi because they they sell at a factory gate at a price right now of nine hundred and sixty nine renminbi per, per bottle, um, and they don't mind too much if the retailer sells it at three thousand or two thousand. Um, it's it doesn't impact their margins, and, and so again we think that there's maybe a misalignment there between the reality and, and sentiment. Um, and then maybe just on the third detractor, um, which is Focus Media, um, which is a, a, an advertising media business. Um, and it's been again caught up in sort of negative consumer sentiment, but, but I'll, I'll touch on this in a moment in our stock examples. Um, but, but it's a stock where we just feel that, um, that, that maybe there's a, again a bit of a misalignment between you know sentiment and what we're really seeing on the ground overall <clears throat> that's the negatives um there are positives i mean hdfc bank you can almost say just by not being a chinese company it's, it's sort of outperformed already because india just by not being china has, has been a big beneficiary uh, but hdfc bank you know has, has been a you know a strong performer this year um and we're seeing india you know it's been it's been pretty robust to be to be perfectly honest, in it's come out of its COVID lockdowns, we are seeing that long term structural growth um, sort of story playing through. But you know, India overall is quite expensive, and that's reflected in our positioning overall and the valuation discipline that I talked about earlier. 
Um, but, but HDFC Bank has yes, certainly been a nice contributor to that for us this year. Um, and then maybe just on China Merchants Energy Shipping, stock that's you know in the tail end of the fund, around one and a half to two percent of the portfolio um, on a consistent basis. Um, it's it, it been benefiting from raising freight rates globally. Now this is an interesting stock for us in that it's kind of somewhat linked to industry change and and the in the general environment that we're seeing. Um, China Merchants Energy Shipping they are a predominantly a crude oil carrier. Um, so they've got a bunch of crude oil contain, uh, shipping contain, uh, ships uh, you know, that float around the world. Um, and this is an industry that's not you know, being much paid attention to whatsoever, really. Um, if you are an oil company, you're going to find it quite hard to lay down your $100 million that's required to build a new ship because there's forever changing regulatory uh, regulatory changes around ESG that you just don't know what, what, what that means. And so therefore you don't know what other costs you've got in the future. So therefore it kind of holds back your decision to, to build that next um, or, or to commission the next uh, oil tanker. And then of course, you know, you can't get away from the fact that in the next 30, 40 years, it, the structural demand for oil is likely to decrease um, in, for preference of renewable energy, right? We, we kind of know that's the direction of travel. So again, companies aren't putting the money down. They're not putting down these $100 million investments. So that means that there is greater supply because every year you get ships that come that are decommissioned um, and those companies that have got ships still sailing out there um, have got less and less competition. And so that, that's a positive for freight rates going forward. And, and merchant, China Merchants Energy Shipping have certainly benefited from that as well. So that's the six months. These are the 12 months, a few of the com uh, similar names as well. And Tektronic, you can, you'll see is a sort of a detractor in the last 12 months. Um, it, it's less so in the last six months. It's been bouncing back a bit. Um, and it's an example which I'll touch on in a moment as well as to, you know, we, we've got some conviction around this stock um, and it's a big position for us still. So, so what, what have been the key changes for us? Um, in the uh, so far this year, Let, let's let's start on on the sales. Um, at the beginning of this year, we had a position in ten cent. It, it was still an underweight position versus the benchmark. And you know, we we sat down a couple, you know a couple of months into the year, said right, what what is it that we, why are we owning ten cent? And there were a couple of things. One is that we thought you know the regulatory changes in the internet sector were behind us and. That was a big overhang for the business and we'll see Tencent slowly um, sort of divest parts of its business, uh, parts of its investment portfolio that it's got. In fact, uh, last week we saw that coming through in practice where Tencent is, is announced a special dividend where they're going to pay out Meituan shares. They own Meituan, uh, a, a good stake in Meituan, a couple of percent, a couple of, uh, I can't remember, the mid-team percentage roughly ownership of Meituan. They're paying the shares out as a form of dividend to 10 cent holders. And so we're seeing the divestment coming through. Um, so therefore a focus on the core business. We thought that would come through. But but where we thought the, the sort of incremental growth driver would be through advertising revenues as well uh, for, for 10 cent. They do a lot of short form advertising. So on the WeChat platform, I call it kind of that, that, that TikTok short form, uh, Facebook short form form of advertising where you know, you've, you've been searching for a jumper and then suddenly you're on the platform and, you know, they're advertising jumpers to you and you click on it and you buy your jumper. Um, you know, that, that's the sort of advertising that Tencent is part of. Now, when we've been talking to, to consumer companies in the, last, sort of, in the last nine months or so, they're aware that the general macro backdrop in China is, is, is weakening and has been pretty poor. And so therefore they're crimping their advertising budgets. And so they've been saying to us, the advertising that gets cut first is that kind of short form um, advertising that I've referred to. It, the click through rates are relatively low. It's you know it, it's good to have, but it's um, you know the the the, uh, the the outcome for the investment is not necessarily that high. And so therefore, the advertising budgets will be focused more on that long term strategic uh, brand awareness type of advertising, and and that's part of the the core business model of focus media. 
Um, and, you know, when we were looking at the correlations between the two stocks, you know, they were you know, relatively, they were kind of going up. And we, and we said at the beginning of the year, well, what is it we're owning 10 cent for? Well, it's the incremental growth in advertising. Well, what's Focus Media's core business? Advertising, but, but maybe more mature um, uh, branding, brand awareness type of advertising. Let's sell 10 cent and, and let it fund an increasing position in Focus Media, which we also thought uh, offered more value. Um, the other thing with Focus Media is, is that they do, um, they, a big part of their business is, is digital billboards and digital advertising in elevators and escalators. Once you've got the screen and you've got the, 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 you know, the plot on the side of a building or in an elevator, you've got it, right? You, someone can't just come and stick a screen in front of it. So, you know, it's a really interesting business model, we feel, and, and one that's been you know, sold off heavily in, in negative consumer sentiment, but offers really interesting opportunities when sentiment starts to return, like we've been seeing recently. Uh, we sold to Sun Hong Kai at the beginning of the year. Um, we clipped the dividend. Uh, it just, you know, the property market in, in Hong Kong is pretty soft. It was a relative outperformer in a tough market. Uh, and we just felt that there was limited upside on, on an alpha generation perspective. So we clipped the dividend and, and, and sold it. <clears throat> um, Hike Vision uh, is, is one that we had to sell with the uh, US sanctions. And so we, we sold that in the middle of this year. Um, and then we've been trimming into strength for China Merchants Energy Shipping. Um, and then Multi, we actually sold it earlier in the year. It had a, a good bounce in the beginning of the year when we when we sold it. But as I said, it's still a, you know, a, a good position for us, a high conviction position for us, um, for some of the reasons that I mentioned. On the other side, um, aside from Focus Media, um, you know, one of the bigger positions that we've been, uh, one of the biggest ads we've been having is in Trip.com. Um, it's a stock that, is in the doldrums or has been from a sentiment perspective because China's borders aren't open and people aren't traveling. Trip.com is, uh, is China's biggest online travel agency. They have about 65% market share. Um, they do a lot in domestic travel. So you know, bookings for you know, train tickets and in, in domestic air travel, which has still been going. And so they've been it's kind of been keeping the, the, the wheels turning for them. Um, but international travel is the higher, higher average selling price and a higher margin sort of product for them. And, you know, as you're aware, that that's just not been happening. China's borders have been closed. Um, and we've taken a view for, you know, for the last, well, so far this year that China may maintain its zero COVID policy for a shorter term period, but it, it, it will reopen. And, and we've certainly seen that um, come through in the last couple of weeks where, you know, China came out of a 20, 20 point policy, basically, which were easing COVID restrictions within China and with regards to things like quarantine of overseas travels. Um, and, and we were using the, the we've been looking at the Hong Kong model that we've been seeing here in Hong Kong, where, you know, throughout this year, Hong Kong has slowly reduced and, re and, and eased its COVID restrictions. Um, and it's been doing it in incremental steps and incremental steps that are haven't been that you know big bang that that fits us to the point where people have almost sort of I suppose not seen them, and we started to see that with China creeping in in a couple of months ago with you know, the the allowing Hong Kong to to do this, um, some of the steps in terms of easing restrictions in Macau as well, um, and and also when we've been talking to airlines, they've been telling us for the last couple of months that they have been. Um, you know, increasing their international capacity and they're going out there to try and reopen those uh, those, those cor international corridors as well. That, that was telling us that they were getting prepared for some sort of easing. And, and we've started to see that come through with the 20 point um, easing, COVID easing policy, the 20 point COVID easing policies that, that, that came through uh, very, very recently. So we were buying ahead of that. And, and you know, in the last couple of weeks, it's been a nice sort of um, a nice alpha generator for us. Uh, we bought into Tektronic Weakness um, earlier this year as well. And the one there um, that many of you may not be able to de decipher, but it's SK Shoe Paint. And so we've been owning SK Shoe Paint for similar reasons to Yuhong, where the paint business again is going through a bit of uh, industry restructuring. Um, the weaker players are being competed away and the strong players at SK Shoe Paint are, are you know, are thriving. Um, or we think will thrive um, because they're gaining market share. 
basically against the competitors and, and those that are dying off, dying off um, and offers them stronger pricing power. Um, and with SK Shoe Paint as well, the other thing is that we like about them is that they're not reliant on primary uh, property development. So they do, they've got a lot of um, business in maintenance and secondary um, uh, uh, secondary housing as well, which is a, a nice sort of cash cash flow earner for them as well. So I've got a couple of examples here. I mean, I've touched on focus media. Um, as I said, consumer confidence is very negative. You know, it, it's a really a monopoly business as well, and and they've got screens in key central business districts in in the big cities that people can't just stick a screen in front of them, um, and so it's a very favourable industry structure. That sentiment downturn in consumer confidence has hit the stock. We've been buying into that, um, and we're certainly seeing um, you know a bit of a turnaround more recently with consumer sentiment changing. Um, but again, when I've as I mentioned, when we talk to consumer companies, they're very clear with us that you know, we, we, we're looking for that kind of branding advertising going forward. And that, that bodes well for the likes of Focus Media. I touched on Trip.com just now. Plans to travel were, were sort of down. They picked up a little bit more recently and, 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 and even, even more recently that's picked up further. And just that whole market skepticism on China reopening where we were saying, OK, we... We, we understand skepticism, but when you see those small points of, of change in Hong Kong and Macau and, you know, President Xi traveling as well for the first time in many years, all these small points were pointing towards China slowly reopening and we're starting to see that come through and there'll be pent up travel demand when, when that the, the will be coming through and that should bode well for, for trip.com. Tektronic, um, as I mentioned earlier, was a big detractor. Uh, was a, a, a detractor for us in the early part of this year. Tektronic's one that we we think is just a really really high quality business. Um, you know, it's really strong management team, solid balance sheet, and a, and a big market share gainer. And and it's been buffeted a bit more recently with with the U.S. housing business that it has. So if we take a step back, what do they do? They do power tools. Um, their brands are Ryobi and Milwaukee. They're their two key brands. I think if you're a DIYer um, at home, you, you, you may have a Ryobi drill at home. Um, you know, they, they've got a very well-known business right? and, and a very well-known brand. They, they compete against the likes of Black & Decker and Stanley. And, and so why is it important to look back to the last two years when we first bought them? Well, about two years ago with COVID, or two and a half years ago now when, when COVID first hit, Black and Decker and Stanley um, announced big job cuts and and R and and R and D cuts as well. Tektronic didn't said we're not doing any of that. So we fast forward to where we are today, and it's put them in massive a massive competitive advantage because for the last two and a half years they've been developing um, <clears throat> they've been developing uh, cordless power tools. They've been working on the battery technology, so the batteries are interchangeable across different tools, and now the incremental so sort of purchaser of, of power tools is looking at these or these cordless tools. And so through that, they are a, mar a structural market share gainer um, because the comp competition kind of st said, we're, we, you know, in these tough times, we're, we're cutting back to the point now where Tektronic from a technology point of view is, is, is sort of, you know, stepping well ahead of, of, of the likes of Stanley and Black and & Decker and, and they're benefiting from that right now. But so, so why, why have we been sort of buying into, in, into the stock sort of more recently? Earlier this year, of course, we all know um, lots of talk around rate hikes and we've actually sort of, you know, we've been seeing them coming through and in the US in particular. And with that, anything that was related to US housing um, got, got pummeled, basically. And, you know, Tektronic, around 40% or so of its, of its tools, that it, power tools that it sells, is related broadly to US um, property, uh, the US property market. The stock was down around 30 to 40 percent on, on rate hike um, news coming through. And so we just sat there and thought, well, from a sentiment perspective, we know why the stock has been hit. But has has Tektronic suddenly lost 30 to 40 percent of its business because, you know, essentially is, is the US housing business dead and buried and, you know, no longer a, 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 a something in its toolbox? I mean, absolutely not. The property sector in, in the US is still you know, turning. 
Um, it doesn't mean because rate hikes have gone up doesn't mean things have st stood still overnight. Um, and then also there's other parts of his business too. Um, it's got a strong uh, business that's linked to construction in infrastructure. And we've been seeing um, some infrastructure projects coming through in the US and those those contractors are buying you know Milwaukee and you know Ryobi tools and so so we're not seeing 40% of the business dead and buried because the the rate hikes have gone up and and so we've actually been seeing the last few months that the stock has actually been working uh, and we think that the market's caught up to our thesis actually on that and um, it it remains it remains a uh, you know conviction position for us. Um, and then finally, just on position in SK Hynix, um, it's one that's in a cyclical area of the market. Um, it's in memory. And IT is an area that we feel, um, yeah, of course, is, is cyclical, but there are some structural winners there. And SK Hynix and TSMC um, are two of those winners that we feel um, offer long-term alpha generation for us. The industry structure for, for SK Hynix is essentially a duopoly um, with them and Samsung. And so with the slowing global demand for technology products that we've been seeing, they've been able to respond in kind. And you may, may have seen that SK Hynix and, um, and, and Samsung have said, you know, we're cutting CapEx and we're, we're cutting production. That's a way of them controlling supply. And in falling demand, they've reduced supply. So to where the inventory, you know, it, hopefully quickly, and we're seeing this coming through, quickly um, comes out of the market um, and then, it, that they can start to sort of, um, they, they say, sort of rebuild that, that supply demand dynamic, which we think will be ahead, uh, which we think we'll see ahead. Um, the company offers a lot of pricing power and memory is structurally important for, you know, for pretty much anything we, we do from a technology perspective, whether you're driving an EV or you've got a high powered computer or, or, or a smartphone, you, you need memory. Um, in the same way you need foundry, uh, the foundry business for the microchip production with TSMC. So, you know, we, we've been sort of somewhat topping up into the weakness um, and, you know, it, it's a stock that, we, again, we, we maintain high conviction. In. So how's the fund look? Well, this is how it is. I've talked about a lot of the stocks here. And um, so hopefully you've got, you've got an idea of our thinking from a stock perspective. Uh, the one thing I will point out is probably quite um, sort of, sort of, uh, obvious here is the 11.2% 11, 11 position in HDFC Bank. We have paired that back recently. Um, it, it, it's just one of those stocks has just been outperforming. And so we've let the outperformance ride uh, and we have benefited from that, but we have trimmed that back just to let you know um, uh, to, to sort of closer to 10%. Um, on, the, on the negative side, just one thing to point out here is that if we don't like a stock, we don't own it. Um, regardless of its size in the benchmark, and, and that's down to the high conviction. We have high conviction on the on on the overweights. We also have high conviction on the underweights as well. Um, and for the likes of Samsung, you know, it's got good parts of its business. You know, the memory is good, and you know, its foundry business is good. We don't like the consumer electronics as much, uh, but we feel that the combination of TSMC and SK Hynix is is you know, better long term gen uh, alpha generator than owning Samsung. All of that then plays through to our, our sector positioning. Um, so it's built from the bottom up. IT, I've talked about TSMC and SK Hynix. Materials are the likes of SK Shoe Paint and um, uh, Beijing Oriental Yuhong. Um, on the financials, on the underweight stance, you know, we own the likes of HDFC Bank and AIA. We, we don't really like the SOE banks in the region. Um, so we stay away from them. They're a big part of the financials um, sort of makeup here. Um, and, you know, we have looked at Indonesian financials. We've owned Bank Rakyat in the past, just looking a little bit expensive right now, but, um, you know, we certainly see the long-term benefits and structural opportunities there. Uh, but, but the likes of the Indonesian banks, just, just a bit too expensive for our liking right now. Again, bottom up, it's built from the bottom up. Um, you know, how does it play out from a, a geographical perspective? China's the biggest overweight for the stocks that I've mentioned. Um, and then I will mention the Netherlands position here, which is ASML. ASML is a lithography, um, uh, it's, it's a, a lithography business. Lithography is essentially ultra precise silicon cutting that is absolutely fundamental to the semiconductor industry. ASML and 81% of their EBIT is, is from Asia. So the biggest clients are TSMC and SK Hynix. 
um, Samsung amongst others. <clears throat> a lot of the, the machines, the EUV machines are, are sort of manufactured and you know, the, a lot of the sourcing is done out here in Asia. They register their, their, their letterbox and the company secretary, um, you know, is essentially is in the Netherlands. So from a, from an, from a, a, a economics perspective, you know, Asia is its key driver. Um, and when we look at ASML's order book, it's pretty much full for the, for the next generation of EUV machinery until 2026. And nearly, near enough, all of that is from Asian demand, from Asian clients like TSMC and SK Hynix and others as well. Um, the other final thing I'll just touch on here is our underweight in India. Uh, we own HDFC Bank. We, we recently bought a position in a company, a private hospital operator called um, Fortis Healthcare. Uh, but we do have an underweight in India because we just feel the market is expensive. Um, it's you know, pretty much the, mo the most expensive market in the region. It's priced for perfection. Uh, we've got our eye on a couple of stocks, but we would need them to come down sort of 20 to 30% from here before it hits that valuation line in the sand that I talked about at the beginning uh, for us to purchase it. And, you know, it, it's a, a market from a long-term structural perspective is interesting, but at these valuations, it, it just, it's quite hard to see where the risk reward sort of stacks up um, for a favorable upside outcome in, in the nearer term. So we're keeping an eye on the market. Um, there may be some, you know, maybe some misses that, that come up um, because cost base has gone up, but it's being priced for perfection. And so therefore any neg negative or deemed negative news flow might drive some derating um, and we'll be ready with our cash and uh, to purchase uh, such names. So that's everything. And so the, really in terms of our positioning and some of the market thoughts, uh, but just to, to reiterate, uh, really what I said at the beginning is that we're, we're trying to beat the benchmark and, and we try to do that through high conviction, uh, high conviction stock picking and it's stock selection that, that, that we live and die by. And, you know, we, but we do that in a very risk managed way. We, we don't just, you know, just pile into a whole bunch of similar stocks or we don't pile into thematics and, and have sort of factor exposures that, that drive through the portfolio. You know, we look to manage risk. But the primary way we look to manage risk is to understand the business and what the risks are to that business. And um, we're not trying to be growth or value. We're just trying to generate alpha and be money makers. And so with that, we, as I call it style neutral, um, we, our, 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 our style tilts may wax and wane um, according to where we see the money making opportunity. And then the fifth point as well is that when we look at competitors, you know, we tend to have a relatively lower overlap versus peers as well. And so, and so hopefully that brings about a bit of diversification benefits for, you know, for clients as well. So I'll leave it there. Um, I'd like to say thank you very much for, for listening and, and bearing with me throughout the, the, uh, this time. And I uh, hope to speak to you soon and we'll be more than happy to provide updates as they come. So thank you. <laughs>